Why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Just clear my throat. Imagine dude. if you, yeah, if you waited well, until I was doing the recording it before started. The, on and the countdown, <laughs> I was wait, I was going to do it before we got it's into fine. it. But we're now we're now we're talking about we're professionals. It. We're professionals. This is perfect <clears throat> this for the beginning <throat> of the episode. <clears throat> All right. You're listening to the John T Show, hosted by three Korean American adoptees, diving headfirst into what it means to be adopted Korean American and more. And now here's your hosts, Nathan, Patrick, and KJ. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the John Chi Show. It's your boys, KJ, Nathan, Patrick, coming in with another fantastic interview episode uh, on the heels of a really great live episode. Nathan, Patrick, how are you guys doing? Doing great. Doing great. <laughs> hey, that was my line. <laughs> yes, you can tell someone's not paying attention when they just echo the previous host. <laughs> I'm Nathan. Uh, I'm doing Patrick. great. And I'm all right, I'm paying attention now. <laughs> Please be me, and you can edit all this other podcast stuff that I'm doing right now. That'd be great, and I'll watch your kids. <laughs> <laughs> so you're busy, Ooh, is what you're that's saying? Famous last words. <laughs> we just actually had some family photos, uh, and our kids were were less than um, cooperative. <laughs> so we're probably getting to that age, right? <laughs> Yeah, it was. It's one of those times, you know, time of the year. Everyone's, uh, you know, getting their photos ready for the holidays, and uh, um, yeah, the the age that they're at is they're good for a couple seconds, and they'll smile and stand there, and then they're just goofy the rest of the time. That's not very nice. long. So you yeah. get about two seconds. Of <laughs> you do. Good behavior. It's a very short window. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Great. Right. Like, uh, but I'm on a self timer for ten seconds. <laughs> that's true. So, Oh, luckily our friend uh, was in town and he was kind enough to take some photos for us. So, um, but yeah, um, on another front, John Chi show, we are the John Chi show means to feast or celebrate. So uh, we are here to feast and celebrate on our Korean adoption, uh, narrative stories, history and exploration and discoveries of all things Korean or non-Korean even. Just in I the, definitely forgot that a that that was what we did, and then b <laughs> I want to clarify uh, that just John Chi means to feast or to celebrate. Not sure. we are the John Chi show means to feast or to celebrate. <laughs> you just rolled straight into that. So. John Chi, good point. It's the word John Chi. So, but uh, um, yeah, we are. Uh, happy that everyone's here what do you guys uh i know this is a, this is a uh, um a longer episode so we don't want to fill this one up with too much <laughs> too much at the front end yeah too that's, much at the front a, end right that's a good call yeah um <laughs> it's a it's a so as actually it's a really good episode and it's one of those ones where like it made me think about the way we ask the first question tell us your adoption story uh mm-hmm. and then we switch to tell us your story and it reminds me of the heart of the show where we really want to be uh, a platform that amplifies other stories and other voices. And um, <laughs> I think a big part of that is like, we didn't talk much for a lot yeah. of like the beginning portion of this episode uh, of the interview, but like, it was kind of nice to just hear a story like this um, and, and sit with, with grace, our guest uh, as she told us um, in very generous detail, the, uh, the early part of her life. And, um, it's been a while, I think, since we've had an episode like that, not too long, but where, uh, you know, sometimes it's like, it's more of a conversation and sometimes it's like, no, this is a, I really want to tell this. Um, right. and so it was a privilege, I think, to take the back seat and let someone else speak and, and, and hear their story, um, and hear a really, really unique story. Yeah. And it's such an engaging story too. I I remember thinking as she was talking, it wasn't like I was, you know, drifting off into, uh, you know, another world, like in a college lecture or something. I was actually engaged the entire time. So you're saying (laughs) we got good guests. All right. We get good guests. I didn't say anything about guests. I said a college lecture. No, no, no. I'm saying we get good guests. (laughs) We, uh, we're here to keep you entertained, here to keep the listener engaged. We do our homework sometimes. Yeah. I famously do not ever do homework. That's also true of me just in school. I never did homework. But uh, but yeah, it's a really fantastic episode. Um, just a trigger warning for those of you listening. Uh, there is a pretty 
explicit mention of uh, suicide and suicidal ideation. So I just want to let you know ahead of time that that comes up um, and, and it gets uh, pretty raw and vulnerable. Um, but uh, yeah, without further ado, here is our conversation with Grace Foster. Welcome back to the Chachi Show interview portion. I forgot what we were doing, but I know what we're doing now. (laughs) We are here with my friend, Grace Foster. I'm super excited to have you here on the show. Grace, how are you doing? Good. I'm like uh, fangirling right now. I love being here. (laughs) Thank (laughs) you so much. We're also fangirling. We're very excited to have you on. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, I have the double privilege of having had you on my other podcast, which we don't really talk about on the show. Um, but is that I a am... more successful podcast? Yeah. Is it award- Wait, is it the award-winning one? Yes, or is it the, the award-winning other one? podcast. I now, I can say now that I am uh-huh. part of two award-winning podcasts. Um, anyways, that's nice. either and one of them here, isn't here nor one. there. Um, <laughs> yes, very Hi. excited. Hi, Grace. How are you? <laughs> I remember when we first connected and you came on my show and after that I was like, we got to get you on the John Chi show because we want to, I want to talk about your story. Want to hear more about dive into that aspect of it because we really talked about the inclusion initiative, which I'm sure we're going to talk about here. So it is very much an honor and a privilege to have you here on this show, the more successful, longer running version of the podcast. (laughs) Only Um, longer running. (laughs) (laughs) So, with that being said, um, as we start every show, would love for you to share with us as much or as little of your story as you'd like. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, buckle up. This is going to be quite a st- <laughs> story here. <laughs> All right, I'm here for it. But uh, I want to really begin and preface uh, before I share that I want to highlight that I'm really speaking for myself, my own lived experience. Uh, I have siblings and other folks um, that are part of my story that I'm going to talk about. And this is my perspective, right? This is my lived experience. And so, you know, a lot of times, and you've experienced this too, right? When we're talking about our own stories, people like to make assumptions that when we're talking about other people and their lived experience, right? It's like all the same, or we're speaking for them or on behalf of them. I am not. I'm only speaking on behalf of myself. So I just want to make that clear. Also, um, (laughs) not to be covert, but I am going to change some names just to protect some privacy of folks that I haven't. Spoiler alert, her name's not Grace. (laughs) (laughs) I like that disclaimer. That's a good disclaimer. Yeah. But yeah, so, you know, it's folks deserve to have their privacy and um, just want to maintain that for them. And then I just want to provide a trigger warning for this episode. So we're going to be talking about thoughts of suicide. And there's also um, a little bit of uh, discussion around pregnancy loss that I'll talk about. So just want to make sure folks know that. Okay. So thank you for that space. And um, where do I start my story? Well, I will start from the very beginning. So like many Korean adoptees, uh, I was orphaned in Busan at about the age of three. Uh, I don't know my age. I don't know my birthday. I don't know my name. (laughs) I don't know exactly where I was born. But the story goes, and what's in my records, is that I was abandoned at a local market there. And police picked me up and took me to an orphanage in Busan. Fast forward a little bit, then I was transferred, apparently, to an orphanage in Seoul. And I have heard uh, from your guests that this this is a typical story, (laughs) it seems like, that they'll start in Busan, move to Seoul, and then really be associated with Seoul. And it wasn't until I really looked long and hard at some of my records that I realized that my story started in in Busan because I was always told like, yeah, you were from Seoul. So uh, I was old enough, of course, to remember, unfortunately, things about the orphanage. I get asked a lot, um, do you remember your birth family? Do you remember anything before that, uh, before the orphanage? And no, I, I don't. My my body does. You know, I have reactions to things that happened to me, I think, from 
uh, when I was with whoever I was with. I'm not sure if I was with my birth mom or birth dad or caretakers, who knows. But in the records, you know, it uh, alludes to um, that I was actually in like a brothel environment before I was abandoned, which is very interesting to me. And I didn't learn that until I was about 18 years old. And that really messed messed with me (laughs) for a while. Um, So orphan life is not glamorous. It is really um, hard to talk about for um, adoptees or for people in general that have experienced that kind of environment, especially, right, like 30 plus years ago, like things were just different. And what I remember most about it is really like the punishment that they would inflict upon the kids that were there. And that was, I think that was just normal, right? Kids were out of line. (laughs) They got smacked with things. So we were smacked with like rods. Uh, We did like the kneeling against the wall for hours, those kinds of things. We were smacked across their hands, across their back. Um, So those were like the memories that I really take away from the orphanage, which is really unfortunate. And I've carried the story with me my (laughs) 38 years of life. And so um, it's just, it's really just the reality of what orphans go through or went through, especially during that time. And I vividly remember, maybe not the day I was told I was going to be adopted, but I remember like that time. I remember being extremely excited, right? Because that's you're 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 pretty fortunate to be chosen um, out of all the kids, right? To be adopted <clears throat> in that environment, like that's how you feel, and that's what's been that's what's told to you. Is you're so lucky. You're so lucky. And I just remember being told like you are going to America. There's a family that's going to adopt you. And I'm not sure what the time frame was, but my entire uh, time in the orphanages combined was two years. So I was five, about five, when I came to the U.S. Uh, to be adopted by a family in the Midwest. I do remember a little bit of the plane ride. I just remember it being dark. It was probably an overnight flight, which makes sense. And I remember being very scared very excited. I had adult chaperones. And the next thing I remember really is seeing the family that was going to adopt me in the parking lot by their car. And I think about, I think about it now. (laughs) I don't know why they didn't meet me in the airport. (laughs) I don't know why I was in the parking lot. (laughs) I was just thinking about that. That does yeah. seem odd. <laughs> like like but, airports used to be cooler, so they totally could have met you at the gate or something. Yes, or at least like at baggage yes. claim. <laughs> or something. Yeah. I, I don't know. But again, this is a recollection of, you know, 30 plus years ago. So perhaps I'm uh, remembering it a little differently than how it actually happened. But anyhow, this family uh, consisted of a white dad, a Japanese mother, And they had three biological children of their own. Um, So it was interesting, right? It's a, there was, they were a mixed race family. And I never thought about the significance of that until like fairly recently on my, my journey to reclamation, which we'll get into later. But the first thing they did (laughs) was hand me a huge bag of candy. So they just like (laughs) stuffed me (laughs) with candy. Welcome to America. (laughs) Yeah, welcome to America. Wild. We have sweets here. Classic. And yeah, it was amazing. I had never had that before. I mean, in the orphanage, all I remember is rice, a lot of rice. And I remember also um, like eating orange peels out of the garbage. Like that was like a treat to like sneak that kind of stuff. So imagine going from that to like having candy and like as much as you want of it it's just a memory that i'll i'll never lose um it was pretty incredible for a a little five-year-old and and then we get to the house i'll never forget this night and it's pretty amazing to me right at five years old that i remember all this but i'm glad i do and walking in seeing a house for the first time all this stuff that I had no idea what it was. I couldn't comprehend any of it, but I just, it looked so nice. 
and it was bright. The house was warm. They showed me to my bedroom and I had a bed. You know, in Korea, it's very common to sleep on the floor. And that's what we did on mats. And I had a bed of my own. I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> I had no clue what to do with this bed, but it was mine. I had a room. I had pajamas. I had toys. Um, they gave me a bath that night. That was my first experience with that. In the orphanage, um, what they did was line us up naked and we'd all stand there and get water thrown on us. Uh, <laughs> so efficient, right? But obviously not comforting or warm or nourishing in any way. We're just sloshed, you know, like we're animals. And such a different experience being in a warm bath with bubbles and, you know, just a lot of care and love from this family. They were really excited. They were excited to bring this little girl in. And like I said, they had three kids of their own, but two of them, <clears throat> I believe, were basically in college or out of college. And then they had like a, I don't know how, exactly how old he was, but I think he was like nine or 10. So I think they were feeling a bit of empty nest syndrome creeping up, but also it was explained to me that they wanted a sibling for this, their youngest, so that he would have a playmate, someone to have companionship with because his older siblings were out of the house. And the, the white dad had um, participated somehow, I'm not sure, but in uh, Korea in the military. So that's why they chose to get from Korea. So that, that first night in the house, right, I'm getting food, getting a bath, all these things. I, I didn't know what they were, but I, I, I comprehended that this was like my stuff. It was my space, maybe TMI, but I learned how to use a toilet for the first time. I, did, I definitely fell in. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> I did not know how to use one of those. <laughs> did you try to stand on it? I, no, I just I um, just I in. sat on it without the lid down, oh, yeah, and I yeah. just fell. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so no. the, you know, they had to teach me all these things, and um, it was the best day of my little life to that point. Clearly, it still sticks with me. Uh, meant a lot. You know, it's so funny because I think about now. I have a almost two year old. <laughs> and I think about her now just going through that experience. And, you know, my mind can comprehend that as a mom of a little one of how incredible that would be for a little person like that to see all of that for the first time to sleep in a bed for the first time, which I fell out of. <laughs> but I didn't know how to sleep in a bed. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So that was the what would you say, like the storybook experience mm -hmm. yeah. of what being an adoptee, yeah, that's, a transracial that's the close adoptee of the is adoption. like? Right. Like storybook. <laughs> yeah. That's like, narrative. And that's, that's where, where it ends. Yeah. Home. And that's where it ends. Yeah. Scene yes. For yeah. most people. And that's where it ends. But yeah, that that's is your happily ever after. Yes, yes but exactly. that is not where it ended for me. And unfortunately, this family and just the the practices and the culture, right, and our society's expectations back in the day, did not properly prepare families and adoptees and the systems were not properly prepared, right, of what it meant to transracially adopt, first of all, and then what it meant to transracially adopt an older child that had been through so much trauma already. I had lived an entire life before I came to this family, an entire life that I couldn't talk about. I couldn't share. I had no words for. I didn't know how to express e the emotions or the pain. Um, I'm, I don't even know what I communicated to them, right? Because I'm learning English at the same time <laughs> I'm in this family. So I had no way to communicate, really. But with that comes a lot of challenges for the adoptee in terms of adjustment, right? And understanding society's expectations. And then you couple that with white society's expectations, <laughs> not appreciating and understanding culture and heritage and just the entire backstory I had that I brought with me into this house, into this home, into this family. And, you know, long story short, you know, things, things turn sour. I'm not sure how quickly, but, you know, I stayed with that family for two years. And one day uh, before bed, 
uh, I remember the uh, parents coming in and taking me to their bedroom. And, you know, they sat on their bed and had me stand in front of them. And they're like, Grace, you're a bad kid. We can't handle you. So we're going to put you in foster care. You're leaving. And that was it. But I, I, I didn't really know what was going on, of course. I was seven <laughs> or approximately seven. But I knew that this was really bad. My heart sunk. I knew that my life was going to change again. I knew I was losing something. And, you know, I think back now, I'm like, how can you do that to a seven-year-old? How can you look them in their face like that and just do that? <laughs> and yeah, it baffles me. And I hurt for seven-year-old Grace back then, um, going through that literally by myself, right? Because who am I supposed to talk to about that? I didn't even understand really what was going on. Um, Seven-year-olds don't have language tools yet to express feelings and emotions and process and all of that. So yeah, it was really messed up. And um, literally, I it was like two days later, the social worker came, you know, the family like packed my, my bag, my bag of belongings that I was allowed to take with me, right? I had this whole room, I had a bed, I had all these toys, I had all this stuff and it was all like edited down to this one bag that I got to take with me. And they sent with me um, a photo album, which I still have. And if you see my uh, posts on LinkedIn, you know, those photos are really from, uh, it's all I have of that, that time in my life. So I got into the foster or the social worker's car and, you know, she was trying to reassure me. Um, and, and, you know, the goodbye was really like, cold and distant. You could tell, obviously they felt really awkward, right? <laughs> In front of a social worker too. Like here, I mean, we're just giving up this kid that we brought over from Korea to adopt. And we're just like, nope, like discarding her. And of course that's not what they said, but that's definitely how it feels. That's basically what they said. Yeah. But the social worker, I'm sure um, her name is Donna. And I'm sure she saw this all the time. She was definitely an older woman, so uh, I, I believe she had worked for the system for quite a while, and you see this constantly. It's not talked about a lot, but you see it constantly. And she immediately was just trying to brush off, right, what this family had done. She was like, oh, you're, gonna, you're going to this fabulous home. It's wonderful. It's going to be so great. There's kids and kids your age, and you're going to love it, and it's going to be so amazing and wonderful. You're have, you're going to have all these brothers and sisters that you're going to love. And I'm just like looking out my back window, like seeing this house disappear and like seeing my whole world just like disappear. And I'm going to this place. I have no idea where I'm going. And we uh, get to the foster home fairly quickly. And <laughs> I get out of this car <laughs> And there are two white parents. The, this house is on a little hill. It's on a hill. And they're standing like on top of this hill. And it's just the imagery is really funny too, because we talk about saviorism a lot. And it was like a bright, sunny day. And these two white parents are up on this hill. <laughs> and I'm at the bottom and the light's shining on them. And they're just like kind of glowing a little bit. It was just, it's, it's a weird <laughs> memory. <laughs> it was like in a white but, house with a picket fence and everything yeah. too. It was a white and brown house, no picket okay. fence. <laughs> but their hair was blowing gently in the breeze. Mm, and little, yeah. They had 12 disciples around them. Yes. It might have been a bread and wine. flying in the background. <laughs> a dove yeah. lands upon their shoulder. And I don't, you know, maybe my memory has distorted it over the years, but that's what I remember, like seeing mm -hmm. for the first time. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> out runs like a bunch of kids just running, running at me. <clears throat> and what ended up happening was I was placed into a home that at the time had over a dozen kids. And by the time the family was quote unquote complete, there were about 20. <laughs> so it kept, continued to grow as I was a part of this family. Um, but you can imagine like all these kids running at me. It was really uh, startling, jarring. And then not only that, but they were like kids of different races. <laughs> so 
<laughs> I don't know that I had seen like black people before. They had a Latina or a Latino person. They had um, white kids. So like there was like uh, just a really different like environment that I was stepping into for the first time with the white parents with their <laughs> halos, their glowing halos. Wings, yeah. Yes. And their angel wings. And um, I was really overwhelmed. But the one thing that I knew was I'm going to do everything I can to stay in this family. And what the social worker told me in the car, right, was be nice, be polite, smile, don't cause trouble. You know, like the family before, right, told me I was a bad kid and that's why they were giving me up. So I got the message, don't cause trouble. And with this family, it was like chaos and I had to navigate that chaos while at the same time being perfect wondering if I was going to go or if I was going to stay, right? Because I wasn't adopted. I was a foster kid. And I had to figure out like what my place was in the fam. Like, how did I fit there? <laughs> it was so bizarre and weird. And um, I feel like really fortunate in a way in terms of this, the family that I was placed into um, for the specific reason of I got to see adoption and foster care and transracial adoption through a lot of different experiences. I feel like that's fairly, <clears throat> that can be unique for our community, but I got to see multiple different lives, hear different stories, live it with them, but also watch it as an outsider and see how they processed, navigated, how they were impacted, you know, how they chose to accept or deny, right, who they were. Yeah, it was just a really interesting experience that shaped um, a lot of my worldview as I became an adult that helped me like kind of navigate my story and journey in a different way. That's something that I really appreciate and value about my experience. I don't necessarily appreciate having to compete with like 20 different people <laughs> in, in the family, you know, <laughs> so that part was interesting, but uh, we were definitely strange in our community. Uh, there weren't a lot of people of color, very white dominant. And my parents were super, super religious. That should probably not come as a surprise to you, <laughs> especially with the number of kids that they brought into their home. And that really uh, informed, right, how they parented, but also how they chose um, to present us publicly Right. So we were always presented very different than what was the reality in the home. That was really hard growing up. And because I always felt like I had to wear this mask, I call it the perfect grace mask, where I was polite and sweet and didn't cause any trouble and said, yes, I will do that. Yes, I will be that for you because I didn't want to be given up. It was a very interesting like parallel right, to my experience in the church and how that community really adds to that expectation for adoptees, especially adoptees that are transracially adopted by white people. And um, one interesting story that I actually haven't shared with a lot of people. So you're very lucky. You're like the first to hear this. A little John Chi exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> I got to randomly meet a couple that was thinking about adopting me from the family that had rejected me first, but they were an older couple and they decided not to because they wanted me to have the best life possible. And they thought that their age and the fact that I wouldn't have siblings, they thought that that was not gonna provide a good life mm. for me. And it's interesting, right? Cause here's white people, oh, they were white, white people again <laughs> deciding <laughs> for transracial <laughs> adoptees, what's best for them. And it makes me a little sad because I really, I wonder a lot how my life would have been different had I been adopted by this family that could focus all of their care and love and attention on me, where I wasn't one of 20 plus, but I was like their one and only. Um, I think about that a lot, but yeah, I, I don't share that very often. So anyway, this family just continued to grow <clears throat> and 
I was about seven when I entered. And just over a year or so afterwards, I was released for adoption. And then they went through the process of adopting me. And, you know, I'm not going to get into all, all the details. You can read it um, on uh, the stuff that I write on LinkedIn. But, you know, this, I just constantly was performing for them. I had this facade of being perfect. And even like the first week I was there, the um, first family that had, a, uh, well, intended to adopt me, they didn't, but the first family that brought me over was very, very strict about etiquette and rules and discipline. And I think, you know, the Japanese mother might have had something to do with that <clears throat> and the military father, right? And so I came into the home where it was just chaos, <laughs> but I was yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Please. Thank you. Can I have more vegetables, please? Right? Like I wanted to eat vegetables and not sweets and not candy. Like I was trying to eat vegetables because I wanted to be the perfect kid. And I had really amazing posture. Like I, I practiced walking with books and crossing my legs, all these things. Right. And the parents of this new home, like literally said to me, like, wow, you are like so perfect. We love that about you. Ding, ding, ding. Guess what's stuck in my head forever. You are perfect. That's what we love about you. So don't risk, don't put that at risk. Right. And that's how I navigated my entire childhood was thinking like I had to be perfect because that's what they loved about me. This home was like, in terms of our socioeconomic status, you know, we're pretty working class. You can imagine with all those kids, <laughs> There wasn't a lot of extra income floating around, and uh, the the mom stayed at home, worked in the home, and the dad worked in the church. So again, not a lot of <laughs> income there. Um, but of course, you know they did get stipends and stuff from the government from all their foster kids that they had and adoptees that they had. So I spent a lot of my childhood right. This is how I could prove that I was perfect. This is how I could prove I was valuable, that they needed to keep me, right? I was a workhorse. Everyone in the, the home, you know, we all did chores and all that kind of stuff. We had to, but I always made sure that I went the extra mile. I took on more, was constantly trying to please by outputting <clears throat> and proving that I could output and was valuable in this way. And that's the, I would constantly get that feedback loop oh, we love that you did this. Like, this is this, like, basically like, this is why we love you. <laughs> so then I would do more of that. And that's where I thought my value was. I started working around nine, 10 years old. I had three paper routes. Uh, I delivered papers every day. That's pretty incredible to think about now, like a little nine-year-old doing this every day. <laughs> <laughs> like you literally have to do it every day. And I just, I hadn't stopped working since. And by the time I reached high school, um, we had all been, uh, this is another pretty incredible experience in this home. We were all homeschooled. And so we basically self-taught ourselves. <laughs> and uh, the mom, you know, helped with tests and all that kind of stuff. But we didn't have like teachers so we had to teach ourselves, like read and study on our own and really guide ourselves through whatever the curriculum was. And I um, didn't do well in that environment. I'm a very smart person. I'm a very capable person. Like you see who I am now, right? And obviously uh, I can do very well. But in that kind of environment, I didn't thrive. And I wanted to go to school really bad. Um, I wanted to also get, just get out of that home because <laughs> you can imagine it was just always work, 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 work. And I'm always having to put on this like mask of being perfect. So in order to go to school, we had to go to a, a private Christian school, but we had to pay for it. So I was like, yep, all my paper out money. And then, uh, you know, I got a job at McDonald's and I was paying for my high school education at 14 years old. It was several thousand dollars a year. Like it was a lot for a high schooler to pay, but I did it. It was a Christian private school. And so you can imagine like, you know, the environment was very much the same. Conservative, very white, 
But now, instead of being surrounded by siblings that I could like relate to, I was surrounded by a lot of privilege and wealth. And just, um, it was completely different experience. And I was the girl that worked at McDonald's that walked in her McDonald's uniform from school (laughs) to go to work every day so I could pay for my high school education. So that was really interesting. But, you know, that kind of experience really impacted how I navigated the adult world and how I saw like it continued right to reinforce like this is this is your value. Like, what can you output? What can you bring to the table. And, you know, that environment in high school um, was not great for me. It was good for me academically. All of a sudden I'm getting like straight A's. It brought out what I needed. I needed that social environment. I am a competitive person. And so it brought out the best in me academically. Um, But it was hard, right? I'm going to school at 7.30 in the morning, going to work, coming home, doing all my chores, doing my homework. I'm in bed at like midnight or 1 a.m. and doing it all over again. And it was a very, um, I guess it's just, you know, very telling of like how I would then repeat those patterns and always living my life as a transracial adoptee who thought this is the only way that I'm valuable in society is if I can do this. And in school, being surrounded by Kids that just did not understand what that meant. Like they had no concept of what it was like to be a kid like that, to grow up in a home like that, to really be marginalized in the ways that we're marginalized. And on top of it all, I am Asian, (laughs) surrounded by white faces. And all I wanted to be was like everybody else But I stood out so badly, not only because I was Asian American, but because I was a part of this humongous family that was really weird and odd. And I was the girl in the McDonald's uniform that everyone made fun of. And so like, I just constantly stood out like this. And I would say like the white boys in my school were the worst bullies, but I got bullied by everybody, either subtly or really overtly. I really excelled in art though. So I'm an amazing drawer and I'm a really great singer. And I was able to find some solace in the arts, thankfully. And, you know, my teachers weren't perfect, but my teachers really nurtured those parts of me and encouraged me. It was the first time I heard, right, you're good at something. You have value for something other than work. It was amazing. I don't know if I would have made it to college without those specific teachers really sharing that with me and believing in me and showing me that I had value outside of just work and what I could output. I did um, mention in the beginning, right, that there was going to be a trigger warning. So here, here it comes. And I just want the audience to be prepared. Um, But just talking about thoughts of suicide a little bit, In the home that I was in, it wasn't the best environment for me. I didn't have the best experience. It wasn't the most awful experience, right? I've heard a lot of different stories from really awful placements, especially from people in the foster care space where they're moved from home to home to home to home to home. And I actually had siblings who had been in 10 homes, 12 homes. By the time they were four years old, five years old, it was ridiculous. But with my experience, even though it wasn't that extreme, I was having a really hard home life and then coupling that with a really hard school life, right? Where I didn't fit in or belong anywhere. And I had experienced things in the home that just made me hate who I was. And not because of what I look like, right? The Asian part was not a part of this. It was... it. I hated who I was because I couldn't find acceptance or belonging with the family and with the parents that had taken me in. And I think, you know, it's a complicated situation because when you have that many kids, how can you accept all of them? How can you equally love all of them? You can't. (laughs) Anyone that tells you you can, 
They're delusional. You don't have space for that. I have one daughter. We will have another child. I can't even fathom splitting my love for my child right now for just two children, <laughs> let alone like 20 plus, right? So I was going through these things inside, but couldn't talk to anybody about it because the messages from the church, the messages from society, the message from school, the message from friends and community that I had that was basically the church <laughs> saying like, your parents are amazing people. You are so lucky. Think about where you would be without them, without their love, without what they did for you. Think about that. You are so lucky and so fortunate. And, you know, don't you ever dare say anything negative about your family. So I couldn't talk about it. And it was eating me up inside, right? Because there was things like abuse that was happening. And I'm not going to get into the details of all of that, but these things just really add up. And then when you're at a fragile state of being a preteen and a teenager, it is so impactful on your self-worth, your self-esteem, your purpose, your hope for the future, right? I had very little hope for my future. And I had been so hurt and was feeling like because I didn't belong anywhere and I wasn't accepted by the family that brought me in, wasn't accepted at the school that I was at, right? What, what was the point? And it got so bad that there was um, a few times that I thought a lot about it, but there was one time where, you know, I literally uh, had a kitchen knife in my hands and I was kneeling in front of my parents' bedroom floor and I was just thinking, like, if I did this, maybe they'll actually, like, care. Like, they'll notice me. If I did this, maybe it'll make a difference. And then I thought, actually, if I did this, I don't know that it's going to make a difference. Because they're going to see me as the problem, a thing to take care of and not um, really nurture or love. Like, I was a, a, a chore. <laughs> I was a thing on their checklist. And I know that sounds harsh. Um, again, I, I can't speak to their intentions. You know, they're not here to defend themselves. But this is like my experience with what I went through. And I just remember holding that right there, the point on my chest. And I was just thinking about it. And I wanted to do it really badly. But when I realized like this probably wouldn't even make a difference, that was the day I decided no. I'm going to live, I'm going to live, and I'm just going to get the hell out of here. <laughs> like, I resolved to just get, I, need, I knew I needed to get out. Luckily, in high school, I um, was able to meet a kindred spirit. Um, she's not an adoptee. She has a really wonderful family, actually, and they're a white family, but she was also different. You know, she was on the outskirts of, you know, what was considered acceptable in society. You know, she wasn't a girly girl and she wasn't an athlete and, you know, she just, she was a little like off and weird and that was okay. Um, and, you know, she just cared really deeply and felt really deeply. She was, you know, 16 going on 50. Like we all know those people, right? Old soul. And she and I really connected because she actually gave a shit about what was happening to me. She listened and she was the first person that really believed me, you know? And um, she became like the only person I could really confide in. And we got really close, not, not because of the, the trauma, but because like it was a genuine relationship where she cared. And she saw me as a person and she saw me as a friend. And this, her and her family really took me under their wing. And, um, you know, they did the best they can, they could, right? Because they weren't legal guardians of me or anything like that. But, you know, they showed me pockets of love and care and nurture um, as they could. 
And, um, you know, growing up, I was, <laughs> I was grounded a lot. <laughs> so the perfect mask facade, it, it shattered and broke. I'll write that about that in my, in my journey, um, on my social, uh, later, but basically it just like shattered. It was gone. And, um, then I was just constantly looked at as the bad kid, the rebellious kid. Um, and uh, you just, I was just constantly punished and grounded and whatnot. And, um, it just, <laughs> it was just the norm for me to not be able to do anything, um, except work and go to school. And, um, with her and her family, you know, they, they kind of, they could see right behind the external perception of what was going on, of what, you know, my parents were trying to convey to the outside world. And my parents, they were actually in like, they were like asked to speak a lot on adoption. They were, uh, there were a lot of news stories done about them. They were, it was really like, you know, they were put on pedestals essentially. And, um, I'm not going to say anything bad or good uh, about that, except we all agree in this virtual room right now that adoptees really need to be centered <laughs> in these conversations and in these stories. But that, of course, was not happening at the time. It was all about uh, my parents and what they were doing and how they did it and all of that and what advice they would give, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this family uh, from this girl that I met in school, you know, they saw past that. And long story short, I ended up being able to leave my home at 17 because they were there for me. I got to crash on their couch and, you know, I kind of like couch floated between a few different like friends, but you know, they were our, my main ones. And it was just so nice to like have some semblance, semblance of like what it really meant to be a part of like a family. Uh, they did their best to include me in everything and really make me feel like I was a part <clears throat> of their home and their family. And uh, that was really special. And I'm still friends with them to this day. Like we obviously have not lost touch. Um, I'm very close uh, to that one friend in particular. And so that experience really changed the course, the experience, I should back up the experience of when I decided I was getting out, like I was going to live and I'm going to get out. Um, it changed the trajectory of my life. I couldn't have become the adult that I am today, the successful, you know, person that I am today, the mom, the partner, the friend that I am today without that decision, right, to choose me. And then, of course, the help along the way, because none of us can do it alone. And I certainly couldn't. <laughs> so I think I'll stop there. That was a lot. And that's just, you know, the first first parts of my story. But I'm going to stop there. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, just high school. Wow. It was a, yeah. like a 10 year period. <laughs> <laughs> we don't often have guests with stories like yours who also go as deep as you chose to go. And it's an incredible privilege for us to hear you speak. Uh, for the, for, I mean, I assume for you to feel safe enough to speak to that, um, and to share it with our listeners. And I, I don't want to take that for granted. And I also want to make sure that like, that you're good. Um, because we, I mean, we, we do want to dive into all spaces, uh, and, and be here for the hardness of life. And also like, you know, we're, at some point we're going to transition to a snack and have just a, a, a grand old time, but, um, <laughs> but yeah. So thank you for, for sharing and for your vulnerability and, uh, and yeah, just the level of, I think what was really impressed, uh, upon me as you were telling your story. And this is something that, I mean, that, you know, listening to the show, but that we try to do is to really tell stories from our own perspectives. Um, and, and to be really intentional about how we frame situations. Uh, and I, and I think that, that what you did listening to, uh, what was essentially that, 12 year period of your life, um, really, really did that well. So yeah, I am just grateful for you coming on the show and, and sharing. Um, 
I don't have a question because I'm still kind of like sitting in your story. I wanted to just reiterate too what uh, what KJ said, and yeah, thank you so much for sharing all that. I was like on pins and needles listening to that. Um, just, I mean, it's definitely like he said, a privilege to hear that, but it, it's so intriguing. I don't know. I, I'm just the story itself is is so unique, and I mean, I've heard you know, some foster care stories. Um, but myself being a parent as well of three kids, just feeling a lot of emotion. Um, when you're talking about being adopted at, you know, uh, such a, you know, five, five years old. And then, um, again, at seven year old, seven is your, uh, moving to the new, new family, all that stuff is that's the age of my kids, three, five and seven right now. And I can't imagine that. I can't imagine the feelings that you, can still remember or that you went through and then just just all the uh, the emotion that you were portraying when you were telling us that we can see because we you know we're doing this through video too but it's just yeah i just wanted to thank you again for sharing all that um one of my questions is you did say that you had a friend um that you still you know keep in touch with and that you did talk to and confide in but out of the other 19 siblings that you had were were there any other close relationships or any other bonds that you had because again you know they're all adopted or were there any biological kids in any of that 20 kids as well or is it all adopted kids yeah the family was all adopted or foster kids or foster okay but we had um siblings and like related people that were brought in together into the family So, you know, twins or half sisters, half brothers, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I, I kind of feel that in a group of that large, there would be, especially if there were some biological um, siblings in there, that there would be like, I don't know, cliques in a way of the family that they would kind of uh, hang out. Did you, was, was there somebody in that family that you confided in a little bit or that you talked to, um, you know, more so? Yeah. Um, not during my time there. But when I left, when I went to uh, a different state to start going to school, uh, I had a a brother that had actually only been in the home with me for like a few months before he went off to college. And he and I reconnected at that time. So I was like 19 years old. Okay. And he is 10 years older than me. And he had a kid (laughs) <laughs> by then, uh, you know, he was uh, doing his thing and wife and house and all this kind of stuff. And I moved out to the same area as him. And then he reached out. And it was so weird that he chose to reach out to me because we ended up having like very similar experiences uh, within the family, but also like kind of how we came to the family. And he had biological siblings that were adopted in our family with him. Mm. Um, and he came into the family when he was eight. <laughs> that was about the age I came in. And we both had um, just similar parallel stories within the family. And it's so funny because we have kind of similar par- parallel like professional stories Um, We're more alike than we knew. Um, But yeah, he was at 19 years old, like he and I connected. We are, we are still in touch. Um, I, um, I divorced myself. Uh, I like that new term, Patrick, that your guests use. Um, I used to say estranged, which is similar, but I I divorced myself. I chose to separate. I think that both work, but yeah, I like it too. Yeah. I chose to separate um, the contact and, you know from my adoptive family and my siblings uh, almost seven years ago. But this one brother, I still keep in touch with. So Grace, um, I listened to your story. One of the, the big themes that I heard as you told it was this idea of language and of uh, the ability or lack thereof to communicate. Um, and I, I like at five being adopted uh, and uh, in your form, you call yourself an immigrant, which I think is dead on. Um, But being adopted and coming to the States, you probably would have had 
more Korean than not, but obviously like probably not a ton of Korean language, then being forced to speak English. And then again, experiencing, as you said, all these emotions and not having any vocabulary in either language to, to talk about emotions and then on and on and on. And um, not even, and could not physically display it either. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, but then to me, and this might've just been me, me reading into it and I'm reading myself into your story, but uh, when your friend in high school listened to you and probably just made you feel heard and where you were just like, Oh yeah, this, this is nice. Um, that to me sounded like a big relationship, relational type moment where you got to experience yourself being heard, uh, in relationship and, 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 using your voice yeah using your voice and being heard i'm curious how are you finding that like using your voice oh my gosh hold on sorry there's a gnat around my face and also this question is difficult um i'm like trying really hard to either capture the gnat or not eat it okay (laughs) sorry that's okay it added some levity thank you (laughs) oh there it is that's gone. All right. That's got to be the intro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these days, how do you, how are you using your voice and making yourself heard? I love this question. Mm. So let me just say that I've always had a voice that I've used and people didn't like it. But it's because I, you know, I wasn't really afraid to talk about my negative experiences. And uh, really be bold and outspoken in terms of like advocating for myself. We all know in like, uh, white America, like that from an Asian woman does not play well, (laughs) but yeah, despite it all, you know, I, you know, part, I think part of that is why I was able to get into the spaces that I got into, get some of the opportunities that I got. Right. It's just kind of like bull in a china shop. Like, no, I'm getting this. I'm grabbing this for myself. I'm going to be loud and use my voice. But I struggled for a long time, as I talked about a little bit, right? And a lot of your guests have experienced this. Uh, Really hating myself as a whole in terms of my Asian American identity. Knowing that I didn't belong anywhere, right? Hated that. Hated that I I had to look a certain way or act a certain way or sound a certain way. I could just never be myself. I didn't know who myself was. I was literally a parrot of what, you know, corporate America, white America, nonprofit America was telling me to be because that's how I was going to get my opportunities. So I, I didn't use my Asian American voice until recently. And I haven't used my transracial adoptee voice loudly, publicly until recently. I've, you know, had a lot of private conversations with friends or acquaintances that would ask me about it. And I was very brutally honest (laughs) and transparent. But in terms of being more vocal uh, in a broader way, you know, I think it's super, super critical that those of us that have the privilege the opportunity to use our voices to speak out about what our experiences really were and are, how we really feel and what we think needs to change and how we want to be seen, right? And how we want to be talked about and how we want to be portrayed in all spaces. It's really important to me that I'm a part of this community along with all of you because I do have that privilege and that opportunity to do so. And I I have the willingness, right? I I am willing to do it. And what we're doing and what I've seen you all do for the last three plus years is empower more and more people to start using their voices in the way that's authentic to them. And it's only because they're hearing you and they're hearing your guests and they're hearing me and they're seeing it on paper, right? Through our writing, <clears throat> they're starting to grasp language and words and concepts and ideas of how they want to talk and use their voice about our experiences. So that's really awesome. And so, you know, in 2020, <laughs> I only laugh because I think like 
95% of your guests have used that year. We <laughs> are a part, part of, of that wave. So, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I was seeing me missing in the conversations about race equity and inclusion. And as an Asian American, I was grappling with what does it mean to be an Asian American? And I was getting really upset about not finding myself in these voices about equity, inclusion, and belonging to, right? And I'm searching, I'm searching, I'm finding your podcast, which was fantastic. And I found Jerry Wan's stuff, which was great. I found a few others, like I was seeing Angela Tucker, you know, like, great, you know, there's some, some stuff going on, but there's not a lot of this in our broader society, right? There's only like little pockets and snippets that I can find. And I was searching a lot. And there's a lot about it being Asian American and the Asian community, but it was completely missing us, transracial adoptees and foster care alumni. And I was feeling that most um, heavily in my workplace because, you know, I had um, a white collar job. So we were constantly, right, doing the dance <laughs> of DEI work and, um, you know, white led organizations trying to uh, properly do DEI work. And, you know, it doesn't always work well. But time and time again, right, I was being kind of like pushed aside from these conversations, not looked at as um, a real person that needed to be included in these conversations and in these policies and within the leadership of how we're discussing how we're going to navigate this for our workforce. You know, and I'm in leadership positions. <laughs> and they have like racial groups that should absolutely be included, right? There were black voices, but then there were like, really loud white voices. And I'm like, excuse me, there's an eight, like I'm your only Asian American here. Hello. <laughs> like, come on. And because of all of that and just the horrors of us, like, right. Having to watch George Floyd died like 50 times on TV and all of the killings and murders of black people that we don't even talk about. And let's not even get into current events right now, but right, like all of these things that are happening in our society and these voices are not being included at the table and in the workplace, right? That's where we're spending. What do we spend? 60 plus percent of our time at work. That's a lot. And when we can't see ourselves in the workplace and we're not being included in these conversations, that really messes with you. It messed with me. And I was feeling more and more and more like I didn't belong, that I didn't have purpose, that, you know, my voice just didn't matter. My story didn't matter. And we've, you've talked a lot about this on the show, right? When you tell someone you're adopted, they're like, cool. All right. Next. <laughs> What's the next interesting fact about you, <laughs> you know? So it's just not a thing we're allowed to talk about in a real way about how it impacts our entire lives, every aspect of our lives, personal and professional. And I was looking for these spaces where as a professional, like, where can I go to find these resources, these connections, mentorship, just the help that I want to really dive into my identity not only as an Asian American and as a person of color, but as a transracial adoptee and foster care alumni that has a lot of shit that has happened that is impacting me right now. <laughs> I need to talk about it, but it's not a welcome conversation because, you know, my skin's not dark enough or I don't come from the right, you know, neighborhood or I don't have the highest position in the company where I can make it matter you know, that really irks me. <laughs> so long story short, a couple of years went by. I had a baby daughter. I went through an incredible educational experience at NYU where I got my MBA. And I'm thinking like, like these things, like maybe that'll fix this problem that I'm having of not feeling included or belonging, right? I can 
fit into mom's groups or now I'm an MBA and I like I'll be accepted and included in these MBA spaces. Uh, no. And I was always really different in my class. Like it was I always stra I kept straddling lines like transracial adoptees always straddle. I don't quite fit in one world, I don't quite fit in the other world. Like where do I go? And you know, I care about really deep stuff and I was one of like two nonprofit people in my cohort. <laughs> Everyone else was like Wall Street, finance, like all tech, all these fancy things. And I'm like, I'm nonprofit, but I like, I'm a badass and I'm here because what I say like matters and what I have to contribute to the world matters. And I want to do it for social impact. Um, and I want to like, we deserve the best. I keep saying this. And I've said this to Patrick before. We deserve the best. So whatever community you're part of, right, especially if you're in a marginalized space or you're in the social justice space, like a lot of the rhetoric that you get, especially from the people that have a lot of power over you or um, your impact, right, it's a lot of, uh, you know, we're giving you this, so just be grateful. And it just triggers me because it's like, <laughs> no, I've been told to be grateful my whole life. No, I'm not grateful. This is not good enough. And we deserve the best. And I was trying to find where this space in the public or in the professional community where we could talk about this, unpack this, get resources for this, all of that. And so recently I launched the inclusion initiative and it is closing the professional opportunity gap for transracial adoptees and foster care alumni because of like all the things I just listed, right? But in addition, our communities who have these identities and lived experiences, we also lack a network that is curated for us where our unique experiences, skills, knowledge, all of that what we bring to the table like really, really matters and is actually quite powerful and impactful in the workplace. And it brings a lot of like diversity too, right? And so I started this organization and it's still just me, <laughs> but it's launched officially um, and I'm starting to grow it and really build this professional community space where there's a network of peers and also industry leaders. There's um, mentorship uh, opportunities, a mentorship program. That's something I really struggled with. With these lived identities, I could not find a mentor that resonated with me, that understood me, understood my challenges in a deep enough way where I could really benefit from their mentorship. You know, And then um, this community is going to house opportunities for us of companies, organizations that really want to invest in us, have us on their workforce, like provide these opportunities that we don't really get access to, right? Um, because a lot of times because of our lack of network, because, you know, we don't fit in in the white world, we don't fit in in the Asian American world. <laughs> and so we're left out of these great, great networks and we have to build everything from scratch. And then when you're a transracial adoptee or a foster care alumni, and you're like me, you leave home at 17, like you don't even have a personal network that you can build your career upon. Like that itself is like, you have to take eight, 10 extra steps. And so, you know, I found myself five, 10 years behind my peers who had the same job titles, who were like paid as much or more than me, right? but they were like five or 10 years younger than me. And I'm like, what is going on? This is not okay. I'm really smart. I've done all the right things. I talked a lot, right? How I thought my value was like outputting, right? The more I can output, the more valuable I was. That's how I showed up in the workplace too. I always did the most. I was, always was the best. I always took on the most projects, made the most sales, et cetera, et cetera. Because that's how I thought, I was bringing value, but that still wasn't enough, right? For me to be able to break these glass and bamboo ceilings that I face. So, you know, all of that to say, like, 
this is how I'm finding my voice and using my voice simultaneously, right? Sharing my experience and the experience of others so that we can normalize it. Patrick, you talk about this a lot. Uh, Nathan, KJ, you guys talk about this a lot. Normalizing our experiences so that we can move beyond just talking about them and we can be action oriented into like what's next for our community. How do we resource our community? And so I'm trying to do that in tandem with the voice that I have. So hopefully that answers your question. That's great. I think it does. And personally, I love the way that you use your voice. I love the way that you, I've loved watching you grow since we connected first for the first time, uh, probably about a year ago now. Um, it's just been really like incredible to watch months. you. Oh, it's been six months. It feels <laughs> yeah. like a long time. It's probably um, like 2020, honestly. <laughs> everything happened. Everything important happened in 2020. It's been a really incredible journey, and I feel really privileged and honored to just know you and be in community with you as you start this really incredible endeavor. Um, a lot of people who follow me here, follow me on Instagram, or follow me on my other show know that I talk about this a lot, especially when it comes to cross organizational and cross community conversations. Nathan and I had a good conversation about this out in California when we were there for beta LA. But, um, you know, like you talk about, we have to build from scratch. Like there are things that are here. We just have to build the interconnective communication in the tissue between our communities. And right now we don't have that umbrella and we have to get out of our own kind of silos that we put ourselves in, which are great. It's great to have those specific things. And we need something that's wide reaching that includes as many of us as possible, because there are millions of us who hold this identity, especially when we talk about foster care alum, who we don't talk about very often. Um, that makes, we, we, there's a lot of power in those numbers. And so I love it. I love what you're doing. And I'm excited that we were able to have you on the show to share your story. And again, just to reiterate what both KJ and Nathan said, appreciate your vulnerability and everything that you gave us here um, when it comes to your story. And I feel like we only covered that first half of the uh, first half of life. We're going to have to have you back for a part two to cover that second half of life and to talk about more of what the inclusion initiative is doing. But for right now, we're going to go ahead and jump to a food because I need a little bit of snack. I need a little snacky snack. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do a food. Grace is going to stick around and have food with us. And we will be right back. Oh, I got to hit the button. <laughs> Welcome back to the John Cheese Show Food snacky time. See, don't you do you not do you miss doing those, Patrick? Did you? I didn't like even laugh. That, that one it, time? Did, are we really <laughs> in the food if laugh. we didn't? If I didn't laugh, you didn't laugh. I know. Um, it's okay. I, I thought you did a good job, though. I thought you did a good job in the last one. Thank but you. I'm back, and my back is fine too. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot. That's why you weren't there. Yeah, that was the whole reason. Is uh, uh, well, not only that, there's other reasons of of stomach Familial illnesses sickness. in my family but i'm not going to get into that now um we have a snack here that we are going to try with grace uh thank you so much for for uh, uh for that interview and for sharing your story but uh this i said this to you last week i guess glad it made it i said this was a french biscuit yeah, where did you what, get that from? That was from the translation on the back of the <laughs> box. It says French biscuit. Really? Um, it looks like um like kind of like lady fingers. They're like little long um you know, little biscuit crackers. <laughs> I regularly um, forget that. You said lady the translation are, are says Pepe. Well, the tra I don't know what the translation says. That's just what the Korean says. Oh, okay. It just says Pepe. Okay, and they're supposed the to be little like there, it's in a bunch of individual pieces, Little and not sticks. supposed to be one big piece, because this oh, sounds yeah. straight up crushed to pieces. Oh yeah, it does sound like there's a lot in there. I don't know there is a picture of a baby on the front, and uh, it says France milk powder on the front of mine too. So I don't know what that's about. Oh yeah, it does I, say I hope I'm not giving you guys baby snacks too. So. <laughs> milk powder contains seven percent. Where's France? 
I don't know, right on the front next to the seven percent. Uh, it's <laughs> made by uh, I think this is made by Orion. Yes, that is yeah. correct. Excellent logo recognition. Okay, Thank not, you. Not smashed to pieces. Um, not smashed. Other than to that, bits. I don't know anything about it. So let's dig in. It does look like a little tiny finger. <laughs> looks like a slightly larger peanut. Peanut. No, I mean it looks like lady fingers. Or a Isn't smushed, that the shape of a peanut. A smushed vanilla. It's like a smushed vanilla wafer. I guess mm. long vanilla wafer. It smells like a vanilla wafer. Tastes like a vanilla wafer. Oh yeah. Damn. Mm. I'm about to eat this, mm. the crap out of these. <laughs> Why did I just censor myself? I don't know. <laughs> weird. Because it has the word baby in it. And for all the babies you start, out there, you need to start practicing. What? All right. No, oh, for my baby. Yes, for your baby having a less of a potty mouth. <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm teaching my kid to cuss. <laughs> Immediately. Is one pack. I have to tell you guys that my husband's really jealous right now. This is like he wants to do this part of the show so badly. <laughs> he could have joined us. Oh yeah, you should probably. Yeah, He's no very way. jealous. <laughs> we haven't had a partner on the Share some on the food part in a long a long time. Yeah. We used it to have, been... I feel like they used to join us a lot. All right, sorry, mm. KJ. Uh yeah, that's all right. Uh basically this is shortbread. Um, based on the ingredients, we flour, sugar, shortening, egg white, egg woke, egg yolk, salt, rice flour. Egg woke. Uh, yeah. So it's basically it's a shortbread cookie. Um, it's, it's a vanilla 195 cal- 195 calories per one pack. Uh, so we're gonna be okay. <laughs> and we didn't yeah, misread it this time. That's it. There's not. Oh, there is a little bit of vanilla flavor. And as the quote artificial flavor, I need some banana pudding to dip this in. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's good. It it actually does like kind of remind me of uh, the Kosomi crackers, just without the Kosomi mm-hmm. has like a little bit more more coconut and business going on in the flavor, yeah. but like the base flavor is like pretty solid. So I don't know. This is like I said. This is this is a vanilla wafer skinny friend. So yeah, like it's it. pleasant. Like a little, I don't know. There's not much to it. No. <laughs> like, I, but I, I, but I, I stand by my my previous statement where I want to dip something. I want to dip it in something. If it came with a, dip, I don't really so like I'm, banana pudding. Is that weird? But it doesn't have to be banana pudding. It'd be tough fine. pudding. Whatever you want. Just More of a vanilla tiramisu. pudding person, to be honest. Fine. Dip what? Your vanilla cracker. Mr. Chocolate pudding. is more of a vanilla pudding guy. No, that's, I'm that's a, a surprise. Van- I like vanilla, like plain vanilla is one of In my favorite what flavors. Universe? Wow. The main six one six universe. So, <laughs> so if you had a choice of ice creams, you would pick vanilla? Uh, I do a lot of times and it makes people mm. mad. Wow. <laughs> wow. Huh. They're like, There's you're so new. lame. And I'm like, bro, I love the classics. <laughs> I like the the swirl of chocolate and vanilla. All right. I'm down okay. for that. I'll allow that. <laughs> You guys don't, don't really seem interested in my... See, that's the thing. I tell people I have vanilla, and they're like, all right, conversation over. And they like, don't really have no, anything I, to say about it. I understand your whole personality. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> You're boring. <laughs> You're basic. You're right. basic. <laughs> Grace, we usually do ratings one to five babies. What? How many? One to five babies. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> what? <laughs> we, sh- we are going to That's now. That's great. Yeah. yeah. How many babies do you this give? This is your segment, so. How many fine. babies out of five do you give this baby <laughs> cracker? <laughs> Yikes. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, okay, you want me to rate it? <laughs> yes, one to five. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> so, I, I'm a pretty good baker, so I have pretty high standards here. Mm. This is probably oh. like a Probably like a two. Wow. Oh, are you, you gotta like? Are you a good processed food maker? <laughs> no, no. See? So. Do you make your own homemade vanilla wafers? <laughs> I can. You could. Mine would be much better. Oh, I'm sure okay. they would. You gotta. Wow. It needs a little like orange zest or like mm. lemon. Or lemon zest. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I like that. Mm-hmm. I love lemon zest in my cheesecake. Mm. That's a tangent, I know, but. Okay, two, two right, is your rating. Two. I like it. Needs a little I'm, more zest. I'm honestly not and that far away a bunch from of that. Other things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if this came with like a dip, again, I would give it a higher rating. It, it is very plain to me. Yeah, it's I, I don't sit around and eat vanilla wafers either. Wow. I always have to put those in things too. Like, I don't know. 
banana pudding, but other things, you know, I just wouldn't eat them plain. So yeah, I'm going to give it a two and a half. So I'm, all right, I'm down there at the bottom with you too. Uh, Patrick goes vanilla. Yes. How, what do you, what do you think of this? Uh, I mean, I'm enjoying it. I would have, I was going to give it a four, but now Grace is giving it a two and I'm like, Oh, should I give it a lesser rating? <laughs> Um, I mean, this is a snack that I would definitely purchase at the store and eat at my home. Um, I'm not a baker, so I don't really have high standards for my baked goods. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna stick with the four because it, it, it I mean, it tastes in pretty good in my mouth, to be honest. I don't what really have any qualms with it. With vanilla ice cream, would it be even higher? I don't think it would change it. Maybe if it was coated mm-hmm. in chocolate. That would probably Ooh. change. That'd See? be like a, a Milano kind of thing. What if it was coated in oh, vanilla? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, vanilla coating, I don't think that would be make it any better. Chocolate, though. I don't know. I'm See, I'm strange. I got some strange <laughs> things that I like <laughs> for strange reasons. I don't know why. All right. No, I'm going with fine. a four. Have a, I'm sticking with have a four. Have a preference. All right. <laughs> have your own preferences. Have a, it's fine. I'm not judging. Um, I am given this. Uh, I'm also going to say four. Uh... Don't you know, I think I'm gonna you. give it. I think I'm gonna give it a four and a half. Actually, oh, Ooh. you're going up. Dang. Yeah, I'm going up. You're not even. You're not a sweets person, and this is two sweets in a row that you have rated highly. Oh, the, yeah, because I gave the jellies a four and a half. Right, you did. Mm-hmm. So, okay, here it, I think it's actually, if I remember correctly, which I probably don't, but if I remember correctly, my general idea is for what it is, it pretty much nails the assignment. Um, uh, Grace, to your point, I think that if there was like a little extra flavor or Patrick slash Nathan to y'all's point, if there was like a coating, it would be even better. But I think like as a, as a package snack, it's pretty solid. Like it would be versatile. <laughs> you could add it to things like totally fine. Yeah. I think it's a good, it's a good solid basic flavor. And I, like I said, I'm a sucker for uh shortbread or, Shortbread things or things that are laminated are like 100% my jam. I can't imagine getting like a prepackaged laminated good, but shortbread is easy, you know? So, yeah. Grace's face the entire time that you were talking. Oh, yeah, I thought was, it like <laughs> was frozen. Yeah. I thought she was Deeply frozen disgusted like thing. With my, yeah. I was, yeah. <laughs> I'm judging a little bit. Yeah, just a, a little, little bit. bit. <laughs> I think this is a good reason for you to, well, no, no pressure on you, but to bake us some vanilla wafers <laughs> and send them to us. <laughs> Okay, so but can I can do you one better. Here's I'll the deal. So if you better. if you bake it, you have to vacuum seal it. You have to ship it to Denver, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and then Nathan has oh, to yeah, ship it to Nathan us. To us. Ship and it then out. we'll compare. Yeah, like how how the deal is. Because see, the the other thing is, I also feel like it's a little. Um, it's like hard to compare like something that is for, like as processed and prepackaged and whatever to like the real deal. You know what I mean? If it was like real deal to real deal, that's fine. This is more like apples to pears you know sure. it's not like a like an apples to apples comparison so that's why i feel like i needed to temper my rating <laughs> mm. okay. so your rating is basically in the pre in the processed foods category you're not yeah. rating it against other that makes like, I, wouldn't, I mean i, can I wouldn't rate, rate against anything i wouldn't rate a mcdonald's burger up against like a craft burger but i do sure. rate mcdonald's burgers up against like a burger king burger or okay. like what's a craft burger what's a craft burger i don't know like uh, if you go to like a burger competition it's got, like, all the, like, or, yeah. oh yeah like no, like, I mean, a like a nicer, craft beer yeah yeah, yeah. i don't no, know the really good burger places yeah i wouldn't i don't know that i would ever go so far as to say a burger as gourmet but you know just like a an elevated burger. I've heard of experience. gourmet burgers. Yeah, but that feels like unnecessarily hoity toity. <laughs> so no it's no shame to any meat. burger, any burger people bread. out there. Oh, I could name a few, but I won't. Uh I, I st- I was saying the fact that it's just it's kind of plain. That's why I was giving it. I understand what you're saying too, though, that it's it it accomplishes what it's supposed to yeah, be. Yeah, like I don't think it's meant I, to be anything more than just kind of a plain thing. Cracker. Yeah, thing. I just yeah, my rating was based on would I eat it again or buy it again, and that's all. Oh, I would a hundred percent eat it again. Grace is immediately regretting coming on the show no. only <laughs> because of the snack. Grace one. is like, you know what? Actually, just cancel my whole episode. Just don't yeah. even let it go out. We're not friends anymore. It's too don't late for me to rescind part. the conversation piece, but like, everything oh, else these, just it's not going. These standards out. are so low. <laughs> we don't. I'm gonna be honest. We don't have high snack standards. Hey, I was down there with you. I was down there at two and a half. Yeah. So. No, it was oh, a lot of fun. Yeah. I said two and a half. Yeah. I didn't I even hear you I give said it. Was a, 
which is funny because I said that was on the low end, but actually that's right in the middle. So that's right in the middle. I'm, com- I'm completely. That's, that's off Patrick on math. math, though. That's fat yeah, math. That is. That is. Uh, oh, this was a lot of fun. Thanks so yeah. much. Yeah, no, we, well, we really appreciate it. you coming on here, Grace. Um, one, thank you again for sharing your story and for talking about how you have been utilizing your voice and particularly sharing a little bit about what you've been doing with the Inclusion Initiative for folks listening at home who are still definitely listening after our incredible snack portion. Um, (laughs) Where do they find you or how do they connect with you as an individual and how do they find out more about the Inclusion Initiative? Yeah, I am on LinkedIn. So Grace Young Foster, that is my main platform. Uh, The Inclusion Initiative is on Insta. So at the Inclusion Initiative LLC. And then our website too, inclusioninitiative.com. All right. You can find all of those things in our show notes. Again, Grace, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, We're going to get the back half of that life covered. For sure. In, okay. in your story. We're going to get that covered at some point. But appreciate everything you did share with us. For everybody out there listening, if you want to connect with us, you can do so at John G Show on all the social media platforms. If you want to send us a message, you can do so by email to John G Show at gmail.com. You can leave us a voicemail at 972-677-8867. If you want to support the show, you can leave a rating or review wherever you get your podcasts. Or you can go to our website, johngshow.com, buy a shirt, Buy a sticker, buy a glass of some sort. I don't know what else is on there. Buy some or stuff. Or some snacks. I mean, <laughs> honestly, buy me the coffee. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, uh, Kevin. You guys both uh, <laughs> have donated recently. So, yeah. Oh, never mind. I was laughing what? at something else. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you to all of those people. Uh, thank you to everybody that's been supporting us. Um, I think that's about it for our our normal plugs. You can find me at Patrick in the world, wherever I want to be found on the internet. I am N Nowak on Instagram. And you hit me up at KJ Relke, wherever I want to be found on the internet. Also, uh, if you want more grace and Patrick, you can go listen to their episode of conversation piece pod. <laughs> uh, I don't know what episode it is, but it's out there. You can, you I don't know what episode it. it is either, but it wow. is out there. I'm going to link wow. it in the show notes too. I'm going to only, that's only the only thing linked in the show notes is our episode. So then you can go to all the inclusion initiative stuff from, yeah. June, <laughs> from the show it's notes June 19th, episode. 2023. I was just listening to there it. There you go. Hey, so basically thanks, 2020. Dude. I appreciate that. Um, all right. It was, well, a, it was an honor to be here. Thanks so much. All well, of you. it was our honor to have you here. Um, and can't wait to share this with everybody else and for everybody else out there listening uh we'll be back sometime next week next week probably <laughs> i don't know why not <laughs> Chachi. Chachi, hey-o. Hey-o. Press the button. No, I, I, did. I didn't hear it i didn't hear it i didn't hear, hear it loading up either